What we see now is a war against reality. It's a war against the truth. The government is injecting into the minds of every American citizen what they will believe. This is beyond George Orwell. This is on a scale more massive than anything Orwell contemplated. Orwell knew about television, telescreens, two-way telescreens, but or Orwell never contemplated that we'd have technology so portable, so intrusive. No matter where someone's located, they cannot escape this grid that they find themselves embedded in. My first uh, job in journalism was with my high school newspaper, which was a very political, we had our own political slants, and we were very much opposed to Richard Nixon's administration. And Nixon tried to go after the press, but the press retaliated and exposed Nixon. Nixon wound up re at resigning before he faced certain conviction by the U.S. Senate after his impeachment by the House of Representatives. But what, what we have in President Obama is somebody much worse than Richard Nixon, much worse than George W. Bush. Barack Obama has brought seven espionage charges against people in the government who brought information about government wrongdoing, whistleblowers, if you will, some people call them truth tellers, brought information to the media. President Obama has indicted eight individuals, if we now include Edward Snowden as the eighth. None of President Obama's predecessors, all put together since the Espionage Act was passed in 1917 by President Woodrow Wilson, no predecessor has indicted so many people under the Espionage Act. In, in fact, most presidents never use the Espionage Act, but President Obama has indicted more people under the Espionage Act than all of his predecessors combined since the administration of Wilson. And this has sent a chill through the investigative journalism community in Washington and around the country. Journalists are now afraid to talk to sources because they don't want to expose their sources. Sources are, in fact, afraid to talk to a journalist because of the fear they may be indicted and sent to prison for an awfully long time. We've seen President Obama and his, sec or his Attorney General, Eric Holder, conduct illegal surveillance against over 100 reporters and editors of the Associated Press, a Fox News reporter who covers the State Department, a New York Times reporter, Jim Risen, who, t who had a source within the government. They're trying to get the, the New York Times reporter Risen to, to sit and testify before a grand jury to expose his source. This is rather unprecedented. And even Richard Nixon, as much as he may want to have done some of these things, knew what his constraints were. And we never even saw this type of activity at the height of Watergate. Everything that's been released by Ed Snowden was pretty well known. Um, it was the subject of a European Union investigation by the EU Parliament in the 99-2000 time frame. Uh, it was a subject uh, of, of a number of uh, magazine articles, newspaper articles, and uh, it was in Jim Banford's book, uh, The Shadow Factory. Uh, and the only real New information we got was the intensity and the size of NSA surveillance network and some of the new code words assigned to some of the surveillance projects. What we were uh, told about was uh, metadata surveillance, capturing data off the transatlantic 14 cable, TAT-14. Uh, this was a joint operation between NSA and its sister activity in Britain called the Government Communications Headquarters, GCHQ. Uh, the tap of the cable was done at, at a facility in Cornwall, and uh, the project, uh, according to the information released by Snowden, was called Tempora. That was new information. The fact that the cables were being tapped, and not just the one uh, going from Cornwall to New Jersey, but many other cables around the world 
were also being similarly tapped, what we were told about was the NSA's cover term for that operation, Tempora. We also know that PRISM, uh, this uh, metadata collection project, uh, was also revealed by Snowden. We had not heard that name before, although there is a commercial product that basically does the same thing uh, that's offered up by a federal contractor called Palantir. We've seen attacks on journalists in the past, but we've al also seen uh, journalists around the country try to expose those who murder journalists. Um, in 1976, a very brave journalist named Don Bowles was investigating the mafia in Phoenix, Arizona, and it got into a lot of areas that were uncomfortable to a lot of people. And Don Bowles got into his car and it blew up, but before he died, he, he, he urged people to continue the investigation he started. And, the investigative reporters and editors group was founded basically in his name. Journalists came together, but nowadays when a Michael Hastings dies in his car in a, in a manner very similar to what happened to Don Bowles, we have people that are just, oh, it must be an accident. They're going along with the, with the flow. They're not questioning the, the, the Los Angeles Police Department. Every journalist should question anybody from the government. White House Press Secretary Jay Carney should not have this love fest that he has in these White House press conferences. They should be confrontational by nature, but they're not. They're just, you know, they might as well be coffee clutches where the journalists get together and talk about the weather and, um, you know, what Carney's uh, weekend plans are. But that's essentially what we have today. We don't have a confrontational press. And if we get a reporter, in the White House or at the Pentagon or at a State Department briefing who gets a little confrontational, they have their press credentials pulled. And without credentials, without access, you no longer have a job in the corporate media. Michael Hastings, of course, did try to bring to attention, the attention of the American people, what was going on behind the scenes, as any true investigative journalist would do. But one evening in Los Angeles, his car literally blew up and he was burned beyond recognition. And here again, we have another case of yet another journalist dying under mysterious causes. The corporate press goes along their merry old way and believes everything that the LA Police Department is telling it. Just as the corporate press destroyed the career of enterprising investigative journalist Gary Webb, who we were told shot himself twice in the head. He exposed the whole CIA cocaine operation. And we've seen it uh, in other cases with journalists who were not as well known, but definitely were looking into uh, very uh, egregious situations with private companies, government, so forth and so on. President Obama has waged a war on the press in the United States unlike any of his predecessors. It, is, it has sent a chill through uh, the, the journalistic community in Washington and all around the country. I've been to countries where there is no freedom of the press, that, that, where dictators ruled, and I have seen how Journalists are harassed by secret police, they're followed, they're wiretapped, they're intimidated, they're harassed. But I always came back to the United States knowing, well, at least we can do our job here. That is no longer the case. With President Obama, we now have widespread surveillance of journalists, intimidation like we've never seen before. And President Obama has brought about a tyranny over the fourth estate in the United States that has only been seen in the recent past in despotic regimes in many developing countries around the world. Where the corporate press should be holding Obama's feet to the fire as they did Nixon, we don't see anything even closely approaching that with the corporate media. We see people who frankly aren't even journalists 
reporting on major stories or under-reporting major stories or ignoring major stories. They're celebrities. They're not journalists. Anderson Cooper, for example, and people like him who are entertainers more than anything else. That is what the American people are get, being given a daily dosage of, and the fourth estate is suffering as a result. Back in the 1960s, Theodore White, the, the famous presidential election historian, wrote a series of books on every election for president called The Making of the President, how Madison Avenue conducted these ad basically advertising campaigns. This is how they created the new Nixon in 1968. Not the old Nixon who was defeated in 1960 for president and the 1962 gubernatorial campaign in California. We now had the new Nixon. Nick the new Nixon was sold like any kind of dish detergent was. It was a product. But with Obama, we've seen the making of the president actually become the manufacturing of a president because President Obama, when compared to all of his predecessors, we know very, very little about his background, his education, many, many holes in his record, many holes in his employment record. Uh, there just is not the degree of scrutiny on President Obama as there was on past presidents because President Obama in many ways is the first manufactured from whole cloth president from the time he was a college student to the time he worked for a CIA front company in New York called Business International Corporation to the time he spent as a community organizer in Chicago where many people didn't trust his, his bona fides as far as being a, a real community organizer to the time he spent at Harvard Law School, to the time he supposedly taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago. We have a president who has gaping, gaping holes in his biography, and very, very few members of the corporate press have been willing to look into these discrepancies because they're afraid that they'll be called names, they'll be called conspiracy theorists, that they'll lose their jobs. Uh, journalists are not supposed to be intimidated so easily. Well, we've seen through history those who appease tyrants, whether it's the Roman emperor who took the Republic of Rome and turned it into an oppressive empire, to the uh, rulers of Europe. When you appease these oppressors, you become a slave to them. And Americans don't want to believe that it can happen here. It has happened here. It's not just the product of movies about a future dystopian world that people say, oh, they come out of the movie theater, thank God. Uh, it's not like that. No, when they come out of the theater, they should understand it is like that. And it's getting more and more like that every day. We didn't just happen into this oppressive government overnight. For decades, what I refer to as the secret part of the government, the th secret think tanks, the federal contract research centers that operate under classified top secret and above contracts have generated paper after paper, report after report, all classified at a very high level on what they see as the future for the United States, the Rand Corporation. Uh, many other companies like that that deal directly with the Pentagon. In the 1950s and 60s, the Rand Corporation got its start by coming up with the Single Integrated operated, Operational Plan, which basically talked about a nuclear war and how many mega deaths the United States could experience in an all-out nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. From the seeds of this insanity, we now have these same think tanks operating in secret, coming up with ways and methods on how to control the American public that are scared about the possibility of a pandemic killing millions of people, a debilitating terrorist attack that wouldn't be planes into buildings or, or uh, 
bombings of marathons, but nuclear, biological, and chemical attacks. This is all designed to bring about the, the goal of turning the United States into a surveillance society. We already know that people who were officials of the Stasi in the old East Germany have said, we could have only dreamed of the technology that NSA is using today to monitor not only Americans, but people around the world. But they've also cautioned, although we dreamed of it, we think this is very dangerous. So for the United States to be lectured by old retirees from the East German Stasi is really, it's, it, it, it's beyond, <laughs> it's beyond anything anyone would have thought of in the past that we now have ex-Stasi officers telling the United States you've gone too far. We had, the, we had the, the famous Stanley Kubrick movie, Dr. Strangelove, where the George C. Scott character, General Turgidson says, if we have an all-out nuclear exchange with the Soviets, Mr. President, 65 million tops. Now, I'm not saying we won't get our hair a little mussed up, but in that fictional dark comedy, the Rand Corporation was called the Bland Corporation. They came up with a plan for a survivable nuclear war with the Soviet Union, but it wasn't just fiction. The single integrated operational plan, the PSYOP, was developed by Rand Corporation to suggest that the U.S. could withstand multiple nuclear strikes in an all-out exchange war, nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And this is where Rand Corporation made its money. And then Rand Corporation continued to be relied on by the secret government to come up with all sorts of scenarios and plans. Of course, the only people that didn't know about these were the people who were paying the taxes, paying the money for these nonsensical reports. But we now have the Rand Corporation and similar federal contract research centers operating under classified contracts coming up with all kinds of scenarios, how they're going to control the country if there's a pandemic, uh, an outbreak of a, some disease that may come in from another country or may be developed right here. The plans are put in place under the authority of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, which most of its work is classified. And then when we see there's a real need for FEMA to do something like the Gulf oil disaster with the uh, British Petroleum Deepwater Horizon or Hurricane Katrina, we see these bumbling federal bureaucrats not able to respond to a real disaster because they've spent so much time on these science fiction-like futuristic disasters of pandemics, Andromeda strains, um, uh, nuclear uh, uh, terrorist attacks, things like that. That's because these are all done to condition the American people to put in place the secret part of the government, how the government will react to these scenarios that may or may not ever happen. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. Are we choosing our own paths, our own destiny, or has it been pre-selected for us? C.S. Lewis said, when training beats education, civilization dies. We need to always be cognizant of, as a free society, that information can be used as a weapon. Barrier to discovery is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. We are seen as nothing but biological androids. To gain control of education in America, not for a philanthropic purpose, but to change the thinking of the American people. From the time we're very young, we're taught to, you know, worship authority basically because that's our key to survival as young children. Discover the history, the present, and the future of mind control. 
From compulsory state education to the Hollywood media brainwashing machine, we are kept in perpetual bondage to the ideas that shape our actions. And the CIA scientists could actually film people who had been surreptitiously dosed with LSD. There's a brain entrainment process that takes place. That gives the government free reign to create whatever story or narrative it wants to create. Whatever the public face of something is, whatever they're talking about publicly, there's something else over here they're probably not looking at. How to engineer the opinion of the American people so that they would fully endorse, not only endorse, but demand a war. When you watch mainline establishment television, you are putting yourself in front of the barrel of a gun. Discover the history, the present, and the future of mind control, psychological warfare, brainwashing. Are we controlled and manipulated? You bet. That's mind control par excellence. Find out how deep the rabbit hole really goes with this new groundbreaking documentary film, State of Mind. Available exclusively at InfoWars.com. There have been so many politicians. For example, the late New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who looked at this penchant for secrecy in the, in the United States. He said it's got to stop. He also advocated taking the Central Intelligence Agency, breaking it up, getting rid of all the special operations units, all the paramilitary operations, and taking the intelligence analysts at the CIA and putting them back into the U.S. Department of State from which they originally came. That was quite a bold statement by Senator Moynihan, although I will add that statement came from Senator Moynihan as it, after he decided to retire from the U.S. Senate. There are very, very few elected leaders of this country that are willing to take on this super secret state that has been developed throughout the Cold War, then the post-Cold War, and now the year of terrorism. When the communist bloc threat disappeared, they had to replace it with something else. And what they replaced it with was terrorism. So we've gone from the communists being the enemy to the terrorists being the enemy to now the lone wolf the American citizen being the enemy. This is the slippery slope we were often warned about. And people say, oh, slippery slope, slippery slope. It's happened. A few days before President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the famous general from World War II, left the presidency, he gave a televised speech from the White House where he warned America about the dangers of the military industrial complex and how it could destroy our democratic form of government. He handed off the responsibilities to President John F. Kennedy, who, when faced with the, the Central Intelligence Agency's abominable plans <clears throat> to assassinate uh, Fidel Castro, invade Cuba, get the United States into a possible nuclear war with the Soviet Union, he told the head of the CIA, Alan Dulles, I'm going to take your agency and destroy it. We don't need that in this country. And instead of destroying the CIA, the CIA was involved in destroying President Kennedy, murdering him in Dallas on November 22, 1963. Kennedy was replaced by Lyndon Johnson, who gave the intelligence community and the Pentagon everything they wanted. And since the days of Lyndon Johnson, we have never had a president who has been willing to take on the, these power structures uh, like the CIA, like the FBI. Lyndon Johnson would never fire J. Edgar Hoover as director of the FBI because Hoover had so much information on, on Johnson. He even had more information on Richard Nixon, Johnson's successor. And any time we saw a president like Jimmy Carter try to do something, Jimmy Carter was set up with the hostage situation in Iran and the October surprise, which ensured that the U.S. hostages would not be released before the 1980 election. President Kennedy, who heard Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex and heeded it, also took action when he 
realized that the Joint Chiefs of Staff had concocted something called Operation Northwoods, which was going to use terrorist events staged by the Pentagon to blame on Cuba to justify a massive U.S. retaliation against that country. These included staging terrorist bombings at public events, hijacking aircraft and crashing them into buildings, and, and other similar false flag terror attacks not created in Moscow by the KGB or by Fidel Castro's government in Havana, but by the American Department of Defense and the secret state, by the CIA, by the paramilitary secret organizations that existed in the Pentagon. Kennedy put an end to that, but Kennedy also then let it be known he wasn't going to tolerate that kind of behavior any longer. So he fell victim to one of the very same secret operations he was so adamantly opposed to. So we go from Operation Northwoods in the early 1960s to the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013. And what do we see at play? We see the Washington, D.C. news helicopters hovering over the home of a man named Ruslan Sarni, who had changed his name from Sarniev, the uncle of Tamerlan and Johar Sarniev, who lived in a very, very expensive home in the D.C. suburbs in Montgomery County, Maryland. And it turns out that he was associated in business with the CIA's long-serving Middle East expert, Afghan ex expert, Graham Fuller. We also found out that Tamerlan Sarniev was attending six months of training seminars in Tbilisi in the Republic of Georgia, sponsored by the Jamestown Foundation, which was started by CIA Director William Casey in 1984. We, so we have a non-government organization the Jamestown Foundation, funded by the Central Intelligence Agency, sending Tamerlan Sarniev into Dagestan from the Republic of Georgia. He's attending training seminars in Tbilisi in the Republic of Georgia that involve people associated with the CIA, and then we're told he's a member of some sort of Al-Qaeda-affiliated organization. Well, he is because when we look at the whole history of Al-Qaeda and all of its franchises, Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, Al-Qaeda here, Al-Qaeda there, it all tracks back to the CIA and the Mujahideen support operations of the 1980s that involved Vice President George H.W. Bush and a plethora of people, including Mr. Casey at the CIA. So we go full circle. The people that were accused of carrying out the Boston Marathon bombing were associated with CIA activities, with people with long histories in the Central Intelligence Agency. But after this information came out, the word came from above, don't pursue these angles any longer. So after the news choppers disappeared from Montgomery County, flying over Uncle Sarney's, Ruslan Sarney's home, there was no more information on the CIA connections. We have people who were involved with the Sarnia brothers. One individual who lived in Orlando was killed by an FBI agent during an interview. He hadn't been charged with any crime. There was a huge amount of secrecy surrounding sending his body back to the Russian Federation. Why was all this secrecy put in place about somebody who knew the elder Sarnia brother? We also had information that the elder Sarnia was involved in the drug trade. Well, certainly when you mention the CIA and you mention Chechnya and you mention southern Russia and you mention the Republic of Georgia and Turkey, you're talking about major drug transshipment points that the CIA's been involved with in 
basically shipping opium from Afghanistan through the Caucasus into Europe. Where was all the follow-up by the media? Where was the front lines, the PBS? Where were all the other special investigative programs looking into these angles? They are not there any longer because public broadcasting is being defunded. The government doesn't want investigative reporting any longer because President Obama has basically criminalized investigative reporting as any despot would want to do. He's no different than despots that have ruled other countries. They don't want state funding, obviously, for programs that are going to expose their criminal wrongdoings. And we saw the same thing with the lack of follow-up on the Boston Marathon, foreign connections, and the provable, provable connections to the CIA. But filling the gap today, because we have InfoWars, we have independent journalists in the field, we were able to find out about some of the things that happened in Boston during and after the, the bombing. And it's because independent journalists were asking the questions that in one time in this country major network reporters would ask. And of course, when somebody who's not on the A-list of journalists in this country who can't be controlled ask a question, people get very uncomfortable and they like to deny access. They like to threaten, they like to intimidate. That is the sign of journalism in a country that does not practice freedom of the press. We know that uh, InfoWars reporter Dan Badandi in Boston courageously asked questions at the press conferences in the aftermath of the bombing and was threatened by the U.S. Secret Service. One can question now why is there this coming together of jurisdictions from federal to state to municipal when there is an event where we have the federal government walking out of its bounds into local law enforcement matters? Because another sign, another sign of a, of a tyranny, and we saw this with the Gestapo in, in Germany, and we saw it with the KGB in the Soviet Union, and the Stasi in East Germany is there is no division of labor when it comes to security. It's one security unit and it answers to the same boss. And that's what we're seeing more and more in the United States with the fusion of federal, state, and municipal law enforcement functions where all people wearing any sort of law enforcement uniform answer to the same boss. And in the United States, that boss is the President of the United States acting through the Attorney General and the Secretary of Homeland Security. The, the news media has known that the, the administration has been wanting to go directly to the American people without the media being able to parse and question and take out what's clearly propaganda from the administration. They want to have this direct feed and bypass the media. And the media, by ignoring what the White House is doing, has slit its own throat because we're now almost to the point where we don't need the anchor men. We don't need the White House reporters. We don't need people in the White House press room asking questions because these people are not needed when you're doing direct feeds from the White House to the American public. So we have now reach the precipice where the government will be delivering news and their opinion and there will not be any room for any sort of questions, um, dissent, other opinions. That is not in the cards. For many, many years, independent observers independent truth tellers were warning about what the government was doing, about how they were aiding and abetting and financing Al-Qaeda. And we've come full circle and now the United States, with the support of the U.S. Congress, with the support of people in the opposition political party like Senator John McCain, advocating, arming 
rebel groups in Syria that are absolutely known to be affiliated with al-Qaeda. The al-Nusra Front, for example, which has committed heinous human rights abuses, where their fighters have eaten human organs on film to the point where President Vladimir Putin of Russia had to say, what in the world is wrong with the West when they support people who commit acts of cannibalism on human organs on television? That's where we are today. And the U.S. supporting al-Qaeda in Syria, we supported them in Libya. Muammar Gaddafi said that I don't understand why are the Americans, why are the NATO countries supporting al-Qaeda in eastern Libya? And he was scoffed at. How ridiculous. Gaddafi was telling the truth. President Assad is telling the truth about what the rebels represent. So it's now admitted that al-Qaeda is the key member of the rebel faction in Syria. Where does the money come from? It comes from America's military allies, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, where the United States has military bases. Woe be it to someone who doesn't look at a map of the Middle East and figure, is able to figure out it's the United States government that's supporting the most radical forms of Islam, including rebel groups affiliated with al-Qaeda against secular governments in the Middle East, in Libya, in Syria, in Egypt. And therefore, Obama, who's very, very sensitive to any sort of ridiculous accusations that he's a secret Muslim from Kenya, is putting himself in the position of having to defend himself from people who say, well, maybe you're not, but why is your foreign policy looking like you are a radical Muslim from East Africa because every decision you, you're making is helping Saudi Arabia, helping Wahhabist, the most radical form of Islam against secular governments where women have the right to vote. Women don't have to wear a veil. Women can have any job they want based on their qualifications. To take countries like Syria and Libya and turn them back into the 13th century because the U.S. is allowing Qatar and Saudi Arabia and members of the Muslim Brotherhood to pump all kinds of weapons and money and personnel who ha have killed American troops in Afghanistan and Iraq fighting the secular Syrian government with arms provided by the United States. The United States, the Obama administration, siding with the most radical elements in the Middle East after they conditioned the American people to hate radical Muslims because we were told they carried out the 9-11 attack on the United States, for the government now to turn around and try to anesthetize the American public about ra these radical groups because we're now supporting them in their attempt to overthrow the government of Syria, an independent country, is, is mind-boggling. It's beyond absurd. But the, the administration knows that they can get the American public to turn on a dime because of their constant conditioning of the American public to accept a new reality. The government controls the means of communications with the American public. So the American government, if it doesn't like the reality they've created in 30 minutes, they can change it. Well, that's what Karl Rove said. He said, we control the media in this country, therefore we control the reality, and if we don't like the reality we've created, just like in the fictional movie Wag the Dog, we can change that reality in 30 minutes or so. The famous Marine Corps General Smedley Butler said in the 1930s, he said, war is a racket. He led Marine Corps invasions of countries in the Caribbean and Central America, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Nicaragua, Mexico. And he later said, you know, we were just foot soldiers for the guys on Wall Street. It had nothing to do with national security. We were working for the big 
moneyed interests on Wall Street. That's exactly where we are today, except Wall Street has become even more powerful. So the military does not go into other countries to protect the United States. It goes into other countries to protect the interests of the moneyed mega banks, the hedge funds, the vulture venture capitalists of Wall Street. When the United States goes into a Libya, it has nothing to do with U.S. national security. It has everything to do with grabbing Libya's oil. When the United States funds al-Qaeda in Syria, it has nothing to do with U.S. national security. It has to do with opening up Syria for new pipelines to be built from the Middle East into Turkey and into Europe. These decisions are made in Wall Street, not even necessarily in the Pentagon. And Smedley Butler had it right in the 1930s, and if he were around today, he would just shake his head. He said, I warned you, I warned you, but I see my warnings were to no avail. We're in a point in this country where there's no easy way out. And we know with the Edward Snowden case, Edward Snowden has gone from Hong Kong to a transit lounge in Moscow. He's in limbo. The United States government has threatened every country in the world who would give this individual asylum that they will face trade sanctions. They will face all kinds of punishment. So we are now in a position where even if you want to leave the United States, where do you, where do you go today to be far away from the long reach of what's becoming a tyrannical government? There's not a whole lot of options available. We see it every day now in the United States where people want to make their tormentors, their oppressors, uh, like them. They don't want to irritate them. We see it at the airport on a, on a regular basis with the TSA checks, you know, where government employees in uniforms are demanding people do things. Take off your shoes, take off your belt. Uh, people who are in wheelchairs, people who are children, people who have ment uh, mental problems and medical, physical, men uh, uh, physical medical problems are harassed by these people. And we just say, oh, well, you know, it's necessary because we don't want our plane to be hijacked and flown into a building. People are willing to give up their, their privacy and their own independence for this false sense of security. And we see TSA now spreading itself to, from airports to train stations, to bus stations, to shopping malls, to theaters, to sporting arenas. Uh, soon there'll be TSA at checks on interstate highways. When you pay a toll, you'll have to show, also show your, your identification because the American people have been so taken in with this quote unquote, Stockholm syndrome. They want to make their kidnappers, their oppressors, their tormentors like them, not the other way. It's not demand that this stop. They, they wanna be complicit in their own abuse. Tyranny's here, you wanna lay down in the face of tyranny, you're gonna be run over by it. The only option is to stand up and be counted. Oh. <laughs>